Thank you, Dr. Gu. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Wei Hong Guo. I also go by Grace. I'm uh, at Rutgers University. It's my pleasure to give a presentation here on the topic of manufacturing automation, digital threat of metal additive manufacturing. Um, in my presentation today, first, I will give an introduction of additive manufacturing and digital threat. Then I will share with you two of my recent projects under this uh, topic. Uh, lastly, I will conclude my talk with summary and outlook. Okay, um, additive manufacturing or 3D printing. I think now this is something, I guess, familiar to the audience. Here, um, it is an emerging technology that enables the direct fabrication of complex shapes and eliminates the waste associated with traditional manufacturing. One widely known successful case is GE's ATP engine, that's the animation to the left. Uh, around a third of the engine consists of 3D printed titanium parts, making it the first commercial aircraft engine to do so. The use of AM technology allowed um, the 855 separate components to be reduced to just 12. This in turn has reduced the mass of the engine by around 100 pounds, uh, improved the fuel burn by about 20%, reduced the test schedule from 12 to six months, and made the engine maintenance much simpler. Another successful case I shown to the right is the 3D printed gas turbine blade. Um, the use of AM led to 50% reduction in lead time, 75% less development time. Okay, the biggest shift in the AM industry in recent years has been away from plastic and toward metal printing. And that's also what I'm focusing on, metal additive manufacturing. Uh, plastic is fine for prototypes and certain final parts, but the metal parts fabrication market is the more important market for 3D printing to address. Um, a lot of these 3D printed metal parts are functional parts, like the aircraft engine or turbine blade that I showed on the previous slide. So instead of, uh, so very different from prototypes, these functional parts need to meet certain quality and reliability requirements. They might need to bear loads, they might need to work in some extreme conditions. Um, the figure on this slide shows the leading metal AM technologies. Each has its own advantages and application areas. Uh, among the six, powder bat fusion takes about 54% of the metal 3D printer market based on the survey from 2019. Materials jetting, binder jetting, and direct energy deposition also takes uh, kind of a, a big percentage of the 3D printer market. And um, in my research, so in the past, I mostly work with uh, data from direct energy deposition. Now I'm looking kind of shifting towards powder bed fusion. All right. Um, so metal AM has huge potentials. It can customize parts for specific applications such as biomedical implants. It can fabricate complex geometries. It can be used to repair expensive parts. Uh, with AI manufacturing can be carried out in remote locations like submarines, uh, ships, or space. AM reduces weight and cost of parts. And there is also potential economic rewards such as new skill jobs created. Um, however, in a survey to the 3D printing industry, when asked what are the top challenges for using your 3D printers, quality control came up to be like the top reason. And even when we look at surveys across several years, quality control always come up to be the first, the first and this is, comes to at least 50%. So this led to the current situation that quality control and consistency issue remains a biggest challenge for the wider adoption of 3D printing, especially for functional parts. And the root cause of this quality control and consistency issue is the, the, the bottlenecks here. And, and here I will just lay out a few uh, specific um, bottlenecks that uh, usually that we 
uh, we want to address, or at least we, we, we focus here. Uh, the material properties during manufacturing is unknown. There is powder variability, machine variability. The parts could have defects, and one of the important defects we look into is porosity. Um, a lot of the printers are a closed chamber, so the quality control is lagging. Um, there's minimal standards and regulation for production and, and parts. Then the process pro property relationships must be learned for each new material, new machine, new geometry. So this means a lot of the uh, methods for uh, like process monitoring uh, developed based on mass production can no longer be applied here. So to help address these challenges, we recognize the need for not only uh, a lot of data coming from uh, sensors, coming from the machines, but also seamless data flow and artificial intelligence throughout the AM process chain. So the AM process chain consists of multiple key steps. Uh, it starts from design of the part, then there's modeling and simulation, then print preparation, the actual printing process, then um, post-processing inspection and end use. Um, each step has data. The data might come from, like for example, the design data or the CAD model, uh, the print design, the process model, uh, data from the sensors, data from quality inspections, uh, and even data from how the customer used this part in the end. So each step in the AM process chain would generate a lot of data. Traditionally, these data are managed separately. And that means the silos of information here hamper data exchange among the different steps in the AM process chain. This causes the manufacturing to be less efficient, prone to error, and lacking traceability. Since many variables and uncertainties intertwine in affecting machine performance and uh, uh, product quality, um, the, the quality uh, of the part is not easily predictable. For functional parts, even a single print failure of a metal part may cost $1,000 and cause a company to miss production targets. So how to harness the data from every step of the AM process chain powered with data science is urgent, but promising to make AM transparent and optimized. And then this will lead to quality functional parts. So that brings me to the keywords of my presentation here, digital thread. Digital thread is a seamless flow of data throughout the product development chain including design concept, modeling, build plan, uh, monitoring, quality assurance, the build process itself, post-processing and inspection. So basically that's all the data that can be generated from the process chain. And instead of letting the data sit in its own stage, we want to put them together into a digital thread. We can think of the thread as a necklace um, and like, what I'm wearing here, but then this necklace is like a thread, and then there's different jewels on that. Each jewel here might represent a digital model or a digital twin or just some data generated in the process. So the ability to um, understand and potentially uh, apply massive amounts of data and intense computing demands within the digital thread um, allows us to enhance and scale the AM capabilities and manage the complexity of AM production. Now, by collecting and analyzing detailed logs of real-time data from process monitoring, it's possible to recognize patterns which reveal where potential defects might occur and where process adjustments may be beneficial so based on the analysis from digital thread, we might come up with decisions that lead to process optimization, real-time process monitoring, control, or continuous improvement. So ideally, these, these would kind of connect to uh, a feedback loop based on the, the, the seamless flow of data in the digital thread and the decisions that it can generate. 
The digital thread connects various digital objects, each a digital representation of the physical object. So a physical object could be this, the, the printing process itself. The digital object could be a simulation model, could be a model just based on the sensor data. Um, so there are different levels of integration between physical object and a digital object. Um, we call it a, a digital model if it's there's no automatic data flow, only manual data flow. In a digital shadow, there's one-way automatic data flow. Um, ideally, we want to have digital twin. In that case, we could have two-way automatic data flow. So for example, we take the data from the printer and then use that to update the simulation model. And then the simulation could be an on-the-fly simulation. The decision from that will, can be used to control the printing process. So in my schematic back here, I was just illustrating a digital twin for the, printer, for the printing process, a digital shadow for the design, digital model for the CAD model, uh, to represent the CAD model there. Okay, to put this kind of this, I would say this um, like larger research topic into more context, uh, I would use laser metal deposition as just as a example from metal additive manufacturing, since this is the process that I worked on in my recent projects. Um, laser metal deposition or LM LMD is an additive manufacturing method for metals. It, um, during the process, metal is applied uh, on, the, on this uh, tool and the components in layers. The laser generates a molten bat on the existing surface into which metal powder is sprayed through a nozzle. The powder then melts and bonds with the base material. Uh, then bit by bit, a new material layer develops, then uh, new layers can be built upon, upon the existing layers. Um, LMD has advantages of very high material build-up rate, um, 3D surface adaptability, it can print gradient layers, uh, it can also print parts with high density. Uh, in addition, um, LMD is free of a sealed building chamber. So these advantages allow LMD to be widely used in many industries. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are quality issues uh, for the parts from 3D printing. And one uh, kind of key uh, defect that we're looking into is porosity. Porosity occurs when very small cavities form as it is being printed. Um, pores cannot be avoided completely due to the process instability. And there are different mechanisms forming uh, the pores. And uh, the porosity not only reduces uh, static mechanical properties, but also induces considerable scatter fatigue life as pores may act as nuclei for micro crack uh, initiation. So there's um, a huge interest in the AM community to um, model the, uh, not only model the, the process itself, but to see if we can predict the porosity um, based on the process data or uh, detect porosity as soon as, as it, you know, it's, as soon as it forms. So I, in, ideally, we don't want to have poor issue, pores issues in the finished part. So this becomes like the goal for uh, my research here. So I'm building a digital thread for the end goal of uh, predicting porosity uh, or, or uh, preventing porosity and ensuring the quality of the parts. And to help me build my digital thread, I would need data from the process. So here I would uh, like to thank my collaborator from Mississippi State University. They provided me with um, some um, experimental data from LMD. Uh, we have experimental data for the print of uh, titanium alloy part. And um, during the process, we have, um, the system is equipped with a dual wavelength pyrometer and an infrared camera for real-time measurement of thermal behavior. 
So to the right, we're showing an example of the parameter data. So this shows the mouth pool during the printing process. The colors would indicate the temperature in the mouth pool. So this will contain very important information. It tells us how the printing process is going in real time. So this could serve as a very important input to the digital thread uh, framework that I, I, was, I was talking about. Um, so this figure here shows the proposed digital thread platform for Metal AM. Um, in the process layer, the AM machine is combined with in-process sensing and in-process control devices, followed by quality characterization. Then data from the process layer are transmitted to the data layer via um, acquisition tools. Once the raw data arrive at the data layer, they are cleaned, aggregated, and then made accessible for further analysis. So here, this data layer may serve as a base for the digital thread. Then we, as I mentioned earlier, we want to eliminate silos of information. So we want to connect these data from different sources. So the multiple data sets here are pulled to model the relationship between the process and sensor signals and the relationship between the um, sensing data and quality data. So here the model could be a pure data science model, could be um, some kind of deep learning model, or could be uh, a finite element model or a combination of those. Then once these relationships connecting the different data, data sources are established, we can use this mo these models to help reveal patterns related to defects or um, this could lead us to real-time control. Um, from a model linking the process and sensing data, this can help us identify um, better designs and this can help us optimize the process. So ideally these elements as shown by the multiple arrows here um, form a closed loop and then the digital thread can be continuously updated and fine-tuned. So this like, digital threat framework is what I'm proposing. And I think that I'm, I'm working on this goal at my, you know, this is ongoing research. So in my recent projects, I've taken, um, you know, I, we have uh, tackled some elements of this platform. So today, um, Max, I'll share with you two projects here. Um, that would become the key components of my digital threat platform. Um, the first model here is a spatial temporal model for the multiple thermal images. So here we have the data from the um, in situ sensing devices. Then from these, then we got the data for the multiples. So we want to build a model to describe these multiple images. And we know that the model here is, should be more uh, either a statistical model or like more like a data science based model because uh, this should um, reflect what's happening in the real process. So finite element model cannot be able to describe that. Uh, based on our model, we, we can use the model to monitor the mouth pools. So ideally, when this model is established, we can monitor these images. And then if we see any um, anything stands out, then we know there is uh, usually like a high chance of porosity issues. So that's the goal for this uh, project. So I'll share with you kind of the key um, our key uh, developments in, in this topic. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, during LMD, a mouth pool is created um, during the process. Um, we use IR camera or pyrometer to capture the images of the mouth pool in real time. And it has been justified in literature that part defects in LMD are closely related to abnormal thermodynamics in mouth pool. So these in situ thermal images are 
vital resources for characterizing the thermal behavior of Mount Paul and lead, uh, help us predict uh, part defects. In building a model, we realized that we need a model that clearly describes the spatial temporal effect in the images. Uh, what I mean by that is um, when the uh, layers accumulate uh, in during the process, the thermal signatures evolve with time. So there's a temporal effect. And also since the temperature is not evenly distributed, um, there is a spatial correlation within an image. So our model to describe this, the multiple images during the uh, 3D printing process should be able to incorporate the spatial temporal effect. So to do that, we model the multiple images based on spatial temporal conditional autoregressive model uh, or STCAR. This model can, or this series of model can effectively uh, analyze time series data with spatial patterns. The model with autoregressive variant uh, expresses the spatial temporal structure with a multivariate first order, order autoregressive process with a spatially correlated precision matrix. Um, so in this model, the um, STCR AR is underlaid by a generalized linear mixed model with a Gaussian link. Uh, we model, so we let the temperature of a unit region in the thermal image be this YKT that we're modeling. And then the distribution mean would be mu. Uh, X here denotes the specific index in that thermal image. Um, then the spatial temporal correlation is incorporated in the noise term uh, phi kt here. So k here would represent uh, uh, like a unit or a trunk within the image, t would be the time. In that noise term for the spatial temporal effect, we decompose this noise term. Uh, we have an adjacency matrix W to specify the spatial structure of all units within the image. We use an alpha here to characterize the first order temporal correlation. Then these parameters are estimated using Bayesian inference with these priors. So using Bayesian inference allows us to update the model when new data come in. So this would bring flexibility to the model. Then um, there is an iterative relationship in phi t across time. So this further results in iterative function in uh, functional relationship in y. Then uh, we come to kind of a, a, a derivation for the YKT, which resembles an ARMA model, but not identical due to an addi additional term. Um, these developments, so this is kind of some kind of like statistical um, proof. These led us to develop two, um, two control charts for us to monitor the thermal images for mouth pools. Um, theorem one here describes a level one control chart for monitoring statistics uh, YKT here. So this one directly monitors the temperature in a small unit within an image. Um, so that means if for each multiple image, we could have multiple control charts here. Um, theorem two builds control chart for global patterns. So this, uh, this one would consider all the temperature values within an image. And then this monitors that QT statistic. So these two control charts are, can be used uh, as in a hierarchical framework. Um, so first we, monitor, we can monitor the global pattern to see if there's any abnormal patterns. Um, and then if there, if, so if there are anything stand out, we can zoom in to, to see at which region um, there's uh, anomaly and then this can help us identify the root cause. 
So based on our modeling and monitoring framework, we can kind of illustrate our proposed method in this way. In model training, we have the sequential images from the sensors, um, and then we build the STCR AR model. We estimate the model parameters using Bayesian inference. Then we set up the two level control charts with the baselines and the calculations for the test statistics. Uh, in the prediction, when the data from sensors continuously come in, we monitor the images uh, first for the image wise uh, monitoring. And then if we see anything stand out, we can zoom into the unit level. From this uh, method development, first we test our method in numerical study, where we simulate uh, we simulate the images to, and define an impacted area. Then we test our method to see how effective we can in detecting the impacted area. And we compared our method to two benchmark methods. Our method shown to have uh, a high detection power with a small false positive rate. So after that, we brought our method on um, LMD. Um, that's the laser metal deposition case that I showed you earlier. Uh, in this case study, we took the data from the LMD of a titanium uh, alloy thin wall. Um, there's, there are 60 layers in that print. Uh, we have about 30 images in each layer. Then um, to help validate our monitoring, we use the prosody as the performance. So we want to see if our detections can be matched to porosities. If porosity occurs at the timestamp of an image, then we consider it's, bad, it's a bad image. Um, then here, I just want to show a quick results here. Uh, in level two performance, where we look at the, uh, the global patterns, we can identify uh, uh, some um, so some images that are that have values beyond the control limit. So that means we identify may, there might be something wrong um, in that layer at that particular time step. So for example, in this case, we find there might be something wrong at layer 29. Then we would zoom into layer 29 and we zoom into that particular time step. So within that image, we, bring, we then look into the more detailed control charts to see at where, so where in the image caused the change in the global patterns. So that tells us where we should focus our attention to and maybe possible adjustment. So here we show some examples of the detailed control charts within layer 29, and then it would show like the trends and then some of the out of control uh, timestamps there. Okay, a quick summary of this project. We develop a model for the thermal, the multiple thermal images. Based on the model, we developed a two-level control chart system to monitor the multiple images. Uh, the two-level control chart, one um, for was it one captures the, the global pattern, the other captures the local patterns. So we believe this model is a key element in our proposed digital threat platform because it helps us understand the sensing data here and then build model for the mount pool. So we know what uh, you know, a, a good mount pool, should, mount pool image should look like. The other project I want to share with you deals with some other elements in the uh, digital threat platform. So here we developed a physics-driven deep learning model for process porosity causal relationship and the porosity prediction. Here we want to link the process data to the sensing data and then to the quality data. Uh, we want to use uh, a deep learning based model, but we also want to incorporate the physics of the process into that model. So why do we want to do that? Uh, when we look into the models that specifically focus on porosity prediction, the models can be uh, classified into two types. 
First, the physics-based models. These are the analytical and numerical models based on experimental data and process mechanics um, to correlate the processing parameters with porosity. Um, they are helpful to understand the nature of pore formation and its characteristics. However, the physics knowledge required to build these models may be incomplete or missing, especially in complex thermal mechanical processes. Um, numerical models require calibration of model parameters. The models are computationally expensive and they cannot be used for real-time prediction. Uh, most importantly, a physics-based model cannot leverage the dynamic and rich process data collected from the online mon uh, process monitoring or the sensors. On the other hand, uh, there is a lot of data science models developed to help with uh, porosity prediction. Um, so usually the methods could be a supervised learning model uh, method. We use the high-speed thermal images of the model as input. Then the output would be porosity issues, yes or no. So these methods uh, allows uh, in-situ porosity prediction during LMD. Uh, with deep learning, uh, we can also handle complex data, such as high-dimensional data, heterogeneous data, and data of uh, big volume. Uh, once trained, the model can be efficient and accurate. Um, however, um, the, these models are usually black box models that they lack uh, physics knowledge. Um, and then the models also need to be carefully trained using available experimental data, which might not be big enough for training a deep learning model. And um, there's inevitable measurement errors, so limiting the methods, um, interpretability, applicability, um, generalizability, and transferability in wider process conditions. So uh, what we want to do in this uh, project is to um, uh, leverage the, uh, the process physics to endow deep learning models with improved accuracy and interpretability. We recognize the advantages and disadvantages in both physics-based model and data science model. We want to leverage their advantages together, so we propose uh, a physics-driven deep learning model for process porosity causal relationship and the porosity prediction. Um, so using the same um, uh, set, like it's the same data from the same experiment. Uh, we have the pyrometer data. Uh, we have the raw, the raw images from one um, LMD process. For the porosity data, the porosity was manually measured by micro CT. Then we obtained the shape and size of the pores in their equivalent spheres. For the porosity la labels, we can use the pore diameter to represent the severity of the porosity issue. Um, and then um, we, have, we can assign a label of good if the diameter is very small, bad if diameter is large. So in this case, we can have binary labels, good or bad. We can also have a numerical response values that would be the diameters of the pores. Then um, this slide shows our physics-driven deep learning framework. Um, the, so we have a, the input drivers XT, then there's the physical model, so most likely a finite element model based physical model. The model has hidden states, process parameters, it uses physics-based equations, um, and then it gives an output. However, we can now use these outputs directly uh, for the real-time prediction. Um, on the other hand, we have data science model, which uses the actual data from the process, and then uh, maybe a deep learning model. This would require a lot of data. The results might not be consistent with the physical knowledge, but we want to combine them and then to overcome the complementary weakness of FEM and data science by integrating them together. 
So to sh show you a little bit more details of this model, um, for the physical model, we use a finite element modeling. We build a simulation of the mouth pool. So this tells us what the mouth pools should look like and some other properties if everything goes well and if, if, if the experiment is in, a, is in an ideal condition. Um, we don't use this for the real-time prediction, but this can give us some information that the sensing data cannot provide. Specifically, we extract some features from the finite element model. Uh, we have the length, width, depth uh, of this simulated mouth pool. We also pull out the peak temperature. So we think we consider these features are physics-based features because they are calculated based on the physics of this process. On the other hand, we have a data science model. For the deep learning model, first we develop a baseline deep learning model. Uh, we call it pyro net because the output indicates uh, a porosity issue. The input would be the pyrometer data. The baseline model is based on VGG16 uh, convolutional neural network. So it takes this pyrometer image as input. The features extracted are put into this uh, vector of 4096 fi, and then the extracted features are used to predict porosity issues with a probability here. So now we have uh, the, this baseline pyro net, then next we can incorporate physical physics-based features into that. Um, one, one approach we take is to add the layer number because from the pyrometer images itself, we don't, it cannot show us which layer it is. So this can be considered an additional information. So we bring this layer number with the features extracted from the pyrometer images. We call this new model PyroNet Plus. So this has all the data science features plus layer information. Additionally, we incorporate all the features from the uh, so these four features from the finite element modeling, we add them along with the layer number and the features extracted from the images. We call this new model PyroNet++ plus plus because it has all the original data science features, also layer information and the additional physical features. And one thing I want to point out is that um, some features here we believe are quite important, especially the depth of this simulated mouth pool, because uh, otherwise from the sensing data, we cannot tell the depth of the mouth pool. It's not something we can observe. So this information would be only available from finite element modeling. Then for porosity prediction, we put our framework into a hierarchical structure. First, we use our pyro net or the PyroNet Plus models uh, with classification in the end to determine whether or not porosity occurs. Then the performance can be uh, evaluated by the like, accuracy, recall, and precision as in a typical classification task. Um, second, if we see a porosity issue, we want to know how severe it is. So if porosity is predicted, we would apply deep learning model, but with regression in the end to estimate the pore size. In doing that, we also want to make sure that our predictions uh, are consistent with the uh, measurement. So based on the measurement device, the diameter can only be between 0.05 and one millimeter. So we force our prediction into that range as well. So this makes sure that the output is consistent with the physics of the process. So now we have all the elements we need for this physics-driven deep learning model architecture. We have the baseline models, then we have two models with additional physical features. They are used in the hierarchical prediction for porosity. So lastly, for this project, I want to show you some results from our model. Um, in porosity, uh, in the uh, classification, we can see that as we add 
phys uh, physics-driven features to the model, the accuracy increases, the recall increases as well. So this tells us adding the additional physical features, physical model-based features are helping with the prediction uh, performance. And then um, if we look at the recalls here, 83.3% uh, recall in the test data come from these two. In the test data set, we have 12 true bad images. In the baseline model, these two are missed, so they are not predicted as bad. Um, then as we add the layer number to the model, we can see we only miss uh, number eight. Uh, the predicted probability for number seven increases to um, more than half. So this would be correctly predicted as bad. Then in the last model, as we incorporate more physical features, we can get 100% accuracy. As for the performance on the poor size prediction, so we can see the errors in the prediction reduces as we add more physical features. We can also compare the measured pore size versus the predicted pore size. From the baseline model, we can see we have some uh, very poor predictions. Um, as we add more physical features, the predictions come closer to the perfect prediction line. So, to sum, to sum up, in this second project, we develop a physics-driven deep learning model approach to um, leverage the complementary strengths of the data science model and the physical model of LMD. Now, this would bring kind of bridge this key elements in the digital threat platform that I mentioned earlier. This brings the uh, they connects the process data to the sensing data and then to the porosity quality data. So here in my in these two projects, we are building elements of this digital threat platform. So lastly, I just quickly mention out kind of an outlook for this direction of uh, research digital threat for additive manufacturing. Um, so I've been mostly focusing on the parts more related to the process data and the sensor data. But then, as I mentioned, there's an entire AM process chain. So there could be digital models or digital twins for, from each stage of the process chain. And then this can be connected into a larger loop. OK, I think that's all for my presentation today. I want to thank my collaborators um, and um, uh, these uh, uh, like the, uh, the support from uh, different departments at Rutgers and also students from my group. I think that's all. Yep, yeah, that's all for, from my presentation. Thank you all for your time. Um, and um, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Professor Guo, um, for the nice uh, presentation. And you, you almost used all the time. Yes, I'm sorry uh, about that. That's okay. Um, uh, I will. So the uh, the floor is open. We maybe take a one or two questions if there's any. So there's uh, several ways to ask questions. One is through the QA, so they can enter, and I will try to read them out to you. And there's another way to do. They can in the uh, they can raise their hand, and I can find them out in in the audience uh, and then I can allow them to um, speak out. Another way is in the Billy Billy, they can also um, pop up questions and the volunteer will let me know. Uh, I do see one question coming up. Uh, so I will just uh, read that out uh, to you, uh, Professor Guo. It's uh, from uh, NA Nothing Hatch. Um, the question is, uh, do you have some pictures of uh, heat pools from areas of the park that ended up uh, having bad pores. Uh, I'm curious whether I'd be able to see them as a human. Yeah, very good question. Um, so I pull up this slide here. Um, here we picked one that really that really stood out. Um, so the colors would represent temperatures. So from the examples here, we can immediately think this one probably is not good. So there are a few ones that really stand out, but for most of them, it's really hard to see. 
like it, it might be some some subtle uh, shapes in the mouth pose or some subtle patterns. It's difficult uh, for for us to see directly. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's the question. Um, while we're waiting, maybe there. Think of question thinking hard, <laughs> but I'm just curious. Uh, for this, uh, are you doing the uh, in the simulation, or you you can test all the algorithms in the uh, uh, you know in uh, real setting? Oh, simulation as uh, in uh, find the finite element model, or uh, we have a uh, we have the experiment, so we can test it with the real data from the experiments. Okay. Yes, uh, the the data collected from the physical planet it's it's very challenging, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So in these projects, I work with a collaborator, and we have some very good data on uh, laser metal deposition. Uh, currently, in our own group uh, at Rutgers, we are moving uh, towards. Um, the uh, powder bed fusion. So we are setting up a new machine and it also has the sensing capabilities with a uh, pyrometer and infra camera. So that's, um, yeah, that's also uh, going to provide us with a lot of data. Okay. Yeah, uh, but in general, yes, data collection is challenging because a lot of those uh, printers are uh, closed chambered uh, it's difficult to see what's really happening there. Right. But for the industry, would there be some, you know, the data they have, uh, you know, security issues? They, they don't want to give them out? Uh, it depends. Sometimes their, they, their machines just don't have the, this kind of in situ data collection capability. Uh, they can have data after like each layer uh, or after certain layers, but maybe not this kind of data in real time. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure uh, there's uh, a question. Let me see if there's any other questions. But if not, we, we already five minutes over the session. <laughs> Uh, there's another session coming up, uh, so I think uh, probably uh, we'll just uh, take the uh, uh, opportunity to thank uh, Professor Guo for your uh, excellent talk. And uh, if uh, I think there's uh, your contact uh, or, or on, online there uh, on, yes. on our program, yeah. or you also show that uh, at the end here. If uh, somebody has questions, uh, they can also contact you, you know, offline. Um, yeah. so, so with that, uh, I'm not sure whether you can hear, but I will make a round of applause for you. <laughs> thank you, for thank your, you very uh, much. Excellent thank talk. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, yeah. Gu. Thank you. It's yeah. my uh, pleasure and my honor to be able to present my work to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, uh, I will uh, conclude and uh, wish everyone over the world uh, to stay uh, healthy, safe, and uh, enjoy the the probably the summer on this side and the north uh, and the uh, <laughs> winter on the other side of the earth. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. So thank you. we will just the conclude session. Thanks. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye.